Great. Thank you so much, Anne-Marie, and uh, welcome, everybody. We've got about uh, an hour, a little less. And uh, I thought we would spend some time talking amongst ourselves, and then we'll take some questions from you and probably run out of time before we can take everyone's questions. So forgive me in advance for that. I thought um, that it would be helpful for the diverse audience to begin with a little bit of an introduction to the scope and ambition of your, your work so that everyone can hear from you what you intended a little bit. Uh, and presumably after this much time talking about your book, you have a two-minute version uh, that you can distill. So why don't I start with Sherry and just say something about this for you has been a, almost a decade of work. But what is the, in the, in the book version, uh, what was the ambition you had in mind for the scope and, and how would you describe the subject? Yeah, so I guess one of the questions at the heart of Five Days at Memorial was actually encapsulated by an ethicist here in Boston at one of the hospitals. And he said, is a time of crisis a time, uh, or is an exceptional time a time when we can make exceptions to moral rules? Or is a time of crisis a time when we should hold on even more tightly to our deepest moral values. So that, that's one of the questions at the heart of the book. And as you remember, in 2005, the floodwaters from Hurricane Katrina really drowned one of America's most beloved cities. And at Memorial Medical Center, the, the floodwaters rose. It became hot because American hospitals don't have to have their backup power attached to their air conditioning system. Um, and then all power failed because, as we saw with Sandy too, also American hospitals in flood zones do not have to have their backup power protected against flooding. <laughs> um, that's still the case. So um, very, very quickly it became clear that they were going to need to evacuate, that they would lose all power, and um, it, it, um, that, that actually occurred. The first question was, who do you save first when you have a, a hospital full of people, you have little babies who might have a long life ahead of them if you get them out. You have the elderly who who worked all their lives, who have so much knowledge, who uh, you know care for others. You had the very sickest whose lives really depended on electricity, and you had healthier people who, if you you know, got them out, might live longer. So um, that was sort of the first ethical dilemma, and the first half of the book really walks you through almost hour by hour as this kind of situation unfolded and these horrific choices became clear. And then the power did fail. Um, some of the desperately ill had been saved for last, to go last. Um, and they became sicker. They started to euthanize the pets because um, staff members, anybody from New Orleans knows that if you want to get people to show up to work a hurricane, you let them bring their pets so they don't have to leave them at home. And they got hot, and people thought they couldn't rescue them. And they started to euthanize the pets. And then they looked at the patients, and some of them looked like they were suffering, and, and this sort of, you know, the word went out around the hospital, we're euthanizing the pets, what about putting some of the patients out of their misery? And um, that was done, and the second half of the book really looks at how do we adjudicate uh, actions that we might consider to be really unethical, illegal, in a context of just utter failure of you know, levies and government rescue and the private corporation and the leadership structure of the hospital. And so the book, uh, my hope, I guess, was to uh, the idea that if we walk through these ideas, uh, through, through the worst case scenarios before we ever have to face them ourselves, that we can take something from that. And what you see is that individual decision making really can make a difference between life and death in the midst of a crisis. And then, of course, there's all the lessons for preparedness. And I, if I may, just since we didn't get to do our thank yous up there, I, I want to just shout out a couple people in, sure. in the audience, if I may, since they made the effort to be here tonight, but uh, my parents for being incredibly supportive all my life, and my uh, editor, Vanessa Mobley, who is just brilliant and, and stuck with uh, probably feels like 10 years of editing of the book. And um, also, just Harvard is a special place, because I've long had an affiliation with the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative and the FXB Center and having that academic home over the years has been really um, wonderful. And as well as the world is based here in Boston, Jem Sharp is here, but a lot of my reporting over the years um, was done with them and there are episodes in the book that, that come from um, some 
you know, incredible opportunities I had to report on them about healthcare rationing around the world. And not least of all, the New America Foundation, which Steve Call was, was the head of, which supported me for two years in the writing of this book. And it's just tremendous to have that kind of resource as a writer um, working on a really in-depth project. That, that fellowships like that exist is just tremendous. So thanks for giving me, and, and many other people to thank too, but just you in the audience and some friends. <laughs> <laughs> Joe. Um, wow, I just can't, we just like have a little break or we can go read the book. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like I'm on the edge of my seat about the transition from the pets to the people. I need to turn that page. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I'm really interested in, as a historian in how the asymmetry of evidence in the historical record reproduces and actually perpetuates forms of inequality in the world in which we live. And all of my work as a historian has in one way or another wrestled with that problem. Um, and this book that I wrote about Benjamin Franklin's sister Jane really has an ambition to try to explain to a reader what the consequences are of what's left behind and what's lost. Um, Benjamin Franklin and Jane Franklin were close their whole lives. They are born six years apart. He is the youngest of ten sons and she's the youngest of seven daughters. There are 17 Franklin children. Uh, they basically grow up as twins, Benny and Jenny, they're called when they're little. Uh, Benjamin Franklin writes more letters to Jane Franklin than he writes to anyone else. He writes to her his whole life. She never went to school, neither did he, but she never really learned how to write. Girls were not typically taught to write in the 18th century, uh, something that we forget. Uh, so as a historian, when you go into the archives and you're trying to recover the lives of women, it's very difficult because you can find out things about them in the aggregate. You can know how many women were committed to the poorhouse from the 18th century, and you can find out their names because someone wrote them down. But what they experienced there is completely invisible to you as a historian because all of them were illiterate. Um, we know this in our minds about, say, slaves or uh, early free blacks after Reconstruction that took decades for, to, to, to remedy and we're still in the process of dealing with educational inequalities. But we don't actually know this. I don't think it's not as familiar to us that women were not allowed to go to public school and women did not, who did go to school, even private schools, were not taught how to write. Benjamin Franklin taught his little sister how to write because he was fascinated by enlightenment ideas that he'd read, read about Daniel Defoe saying, wouldn't it be interesting if we taught girls how to write? We could do this little enlightenment experiment. What if you had a boy and a girl raised in the same family? And what if you, what if you followed them through their lives? What would it mean that the girl never was taught how to write? Um, so I was really interested in using their story as a way to illuminate uh, for the reader, what it means that the archives are so asymmetrical that we have, and in the case of Jane and Benjamin Franklin, uh, another source of great frustration is that although she wrote to him for their whole lives, uh, and he wrote to her, she kept every single letter that he sent to her. She put it in a tiny little trunk that she kept. And for the first 30 decades of their correspondence, which lasted for 63 years, he threw away every letter that she sent to him. <laughs> So there's not a single scrap in her voice until she's 45 years old. Um, and that was a real frustration of this project, but it was also the real fun and challenge of it, trying to think about how, what other evidence I could use as a historian that would meet my standards of evidence, that would allow me to tell her story. So Book of Ages is the name that she gave, the title that she gave to a little book that she made for herself. Uh, Franklin was himself a bookmaker and a printer and a writer and an editor. Um, Jane knew how to stitch books too, and she made herself a little book out of paper that she made, and she put on the cover of it, Book of Ages, and uh, I, the first time I held it in my hands, and it's an archive here in Boston, it's amazing that it survived, it's this tiny little scrap of, of, of fool's cap stitched together with this really coarse thread. It, it starts off, Jane Franklin born, March 27th, 1712, and you think, oh my god, she wrote an autobiography, just like her brother. It's going to reveal everything. It's going to change everything we know about women in the 18th century. What if you had an autobiography written by this completely obscure poor woman? But in fact, it's actually a list of the births and deaths of her children. She had 12 children, 11 of them died before she did, and it's the prayer she said at their death. And it's all that she had of them. She was very poor her whole life. And um, she, didn't, she couldn't afford a gravestone for any of these children. And this is all that she had left. Uh, so the book is really a monument to monuments that people uh, leave for the people that they uh, have lost and the people that uh, are going to carry on in the future. So this is a, a, a gift that Jane gave to her grandson. And he kept it. And he ended up giving it to an archive. Um, so 
what I tried to do in telling the story of Jane Franklin's life was also to show, um, to kind of undo, I think, the sort of dangerous cultural work that Virginia Woolf did in the story of Judith Shakespeare. Woolf, in Room of One's Own, wrote this sort of, um, did this thought experiment, very enlightenment thought experiment. What if, Judith, what if William Shakespeare had a sister and she was just as smart and brilliant and daring as he was? Well, she would run away from home, she would get pregnant, and she would kill herself was all sort of Virginia Woolf could think of, because Virginia Woolf <laughs> could not reconcile a life of the mind with a life of a mother. And it's a, it's a crucial failing of a lot of feminist literature and a lot of feminist theory, the inability to reconcile the life of the mind with the life of the mother. And as a woman with children, I, I see why that's so <laughs> difficult. <laughs> um, but I really wanted to write about this woman who raised 12 children and raised her grandchildren and her great-grandchildren, most of whom died before they reached adulthood, but she did have a house full of children her whole entire life, and she lived a very long life. Uh, I wanted to write about her as an intellectual, as a thinker, as a writer. Uh, and she, above all, was a reader. Franklin would send her books. So she also made a commitment early in her life to read everything that her brother ever wrote. And if you think about that, a woman in the 18th century who read everything written by Benjamin Franklin was one of the best educated women in the world. I mean, he, he was a statesman, a philosopher, a natural philosopher. Franklin had a great deal to say about a lot. Um, her views were quite politically radical by the end of her life. And it's quite amazing to watch her intellectual transformation. And that um, felt like a real, uh, it was a real source of pleasure for me to find, um, to find that redemption uh, in a life of great sorrow, uh, to find that sense of joy and pleasure that she gained as a reader and reading good writing. Great. So, uh, Adrian, you're not done yet, so done yet. Uh, it's probably harder for you to give us full an account of what the book is about, but the citation uh, described this extraordinary discovery, in a sense, that you've made as a writer of this uh, desegregation case that went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. Just give us a sense of uh, where the story begins in this school in the Delta, and we'll come back to it in our conversation, and, and then how it becomes... Um, a piece of litigation that uh, actually ends up redefining and even tightening uh, the laws of the Jim Crow South, the jurisprudence of the Jim Crow South. Right. Well, I emphasize with a little bit of your frustrations in finding those gaps in history, because that's, um, that's how my reporting started. That's how the whole archival process started for me, was finding the little court case in an archive. And the name is Gong Lum on the case. And I thought, Gong Lum in Mississippi Delta, 1924. There's Chinese families in Mississippi in 1924. For some reason, that was a revelation to me. It's probably my own ignorance. But I had no idea that there was a Chinese population. Not only that, but I'm reading the case. And I'm seeing familiar phrases that I realize are cited in Brown versus Board. So this is 30 years before that. This is 1924. And it's a Chinese family, which were part of a, a relatively large Chinese population in the South during that time. Um, they came there sort of after the railroads were built. Some of them came from California. Some of them came on their own um, through Chicago, kind of down across the Great Lakes and down that way through Canada. And the, the part that was actually most compelling to me was that the central character, a lot of what's fascinating to me is just people's own individual decisions. The central character is a nine-year-old girl who was barred from attending middle school. And it's not, it's, it's an unlikely hero to drive a case all the way. They start um, in the local circuit court, which is this tiny little building that's still there in Rosedale, Mississippi, and it is dilapidated and hanging hinges, and it's still totally the exact same building. You would think it was the same people in there. And um, they win in the circuit court. It's this nine-year-old girl and her father, who actually at the time aren't even recognized as being able to bring their own court cases. So they can't attend the court. They can't even walk in the building. They, they sign it outside the court at the lawyer's office. But they're bringing this case because they, this daughter wants to attend school. So they move from the circuit court in Mississippi, win there, and then move to the Mississippi Supreme Court. This is over the course of a year and a half. Um, so we're into 1926 at this, uh, yeah, 26 at this point, barely into 26. And then 
they're, they're told that it's up to the state's rights to decide who can attend school and kind of what the privileges are of each race. And they're told that Chinese are actually, in fact, black. So this decision, imagine hearing at 10, 11 years old that you're not the race you think you are. You're, you're actually a different race, and you're on the other side of the Jim Crow South. And so she, her father and the lawyer moved the case to the US Supreme Court. And the justice at the time is William Howard Taft. So they're going up against the former president of the United States saying, I have the right, this nine-year-old girl has the right to attend the white school in the South. And uh, Taft delivers a decision. He basically says it's up to the state to decide. And so for the next 30 years, we have um, Chinese and the gray races. There's a legal precedent now to say that they, can, they should attend the black schools of the South. So what it winds up doing is it's a tragedy for her and her family. They leave the town. Um, there's an exodus of Chinese from the South at that time. A lot of Chinese actually go back to China or they move north. So in a way, it, it worked against everything they were fighting for. But the fact was they were fighting. And you'll see in the liner notes of Brown versus Board, you'll see this case cited again and again as sort of building blocks for what becomes the civil rights movement. Fantastic. Well, uh, you can all hear the judges did really well this year. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, one of the things that Anne-Marie talked about was how Tony Lucas, who I'm sure inspired a lot of us in the room as young readers and aspiring uh, journalists, um, concentrated quite a lot on his methodology and then on the translation of his methodology onto the page with a more sort of self-consciousness and artfulness than um, many of us as journalists and, and historians. And I would say of the two finished books, they're both uh, distinguished by, by many fine qualities, but um, none more so than the, than the composition on the page. There is a real artfulness um, and care about, and, and restraint at times uh, in both books. And so I thought in the spirit of the awards that I'd ask each of you a little bit to talk about your, your writing and your methodology. And I, maybe I'll start uh, with you, Sherry. I, this is an enormously complex uh, subject, especially the way you framed it around um, the ethical narrative and then the attempt of litigation and justice to deliver on the ethical narrative. Lots of characters, complex setting, and yet, uh, you know, the book is just so well rendered and so, um, so much in motion. It seems like you're working on every sentence and there's, there's an enormous amount of attention uh, to, the, to the language and, and the flow and the breaks. And uh, I just wondered, one, uh, what models did you hold in your mind's eye as you were polishing and working and writing? What were you trying? What books did you have in your head uh, that you were trying to find your way toward? And then how did you choose to leave things out? That must have been uh, difficult at times. Did I leave anything out? <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot I, I of line letting in between the lines, so the book is not as thick as the yeah, as the sheer you. size of the book. No, it was it was kind of amazing because we we felt it was too you know like for the market probably too long maybe and but I remember this moment when Vanessa read it and came back and she's like I can't I can't really find anything to cut <laughs> and that and that was I don't know that then we like we felt like everything that that was in there needed to be there um, but or maybe we were just too close to it at that point but um, and it's so funny Steve for you to ask about methodology because we at New America I, I have told the story to a lot of people and I, I think it's beneficial like if you can ever get Steve to tell you his methodology for writing a book it is it is so well worked out and is so amazing and it's so organized and it's something I will strive for if I ever get this, this courage to write another book. But um, it makes so much so much sense and I think I'm much less efficient. But um, but generally, I, I looked at a, a, a chronological narrative as the uh, as the overall structure because it is you know you don't have the benefit in nonfiction of of choosing how many people are critical to the story and. This was like a two-city block-long hospital, and there were just wherever you stood, 
you had a different experience of, of being there. And um, so that, that was complicated, and I worried about people being able to keep track of things. So I tried to keep what I could simple, and then just using those, those classic tools of narrative writing where you try not to jump forward in time, or if you're jumping forward in time, you keep the characters the same, you, you keep the, um, the place the same. So trying to keep as much going forward um, and, and not confusing the, the reader that way. And then there was a lot of work on every sentence, as Vanessa can attest, probably, probably too much. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I think that, that settles it. And I, I forgot two thank yous, which I'll sneak in here. One is just the judges, because that must be a huge job to read all these books. And, and we are all so appreciative of your time and grateful. And I also just want to call out Jonathan Katz's book, because it is terrific. And your bravery in Haiti um, and reporting that story and your outrage just come through. So I'm honored to, to be here with you. So one follow-up, just mm -hmm. the sentences. Um, when you say you worked a lot on each sentence, some uh, writers, maybe Jill is one of them, the sentences come out with a shine and a polish and they hardly require revision and others really go back and back and back. What are you trying to get to in your own mind? Are you trying to just pare a sentence down to get to a certain active energy and make sure that there are no dead words and no, well, how would you describe it? Yeah, that's, that's a really good way. Yeah, absolutely. And um, to keep it active, to uh, not have extra words in, this, in a book of this length, wanting every word to count, uh, you know, varying the language, varying the rhythm, all of that. Oh, and, and models. So I looked a lot at books of true crime, just as a like a narrative model, because there was here, whether you consider it a crime or not, but there was this act, and then there was the judicial process. So I looked at like everything from Helter Skelter, um, In Cold Blood, um, uh, the um, Columbine book, and so th those were really helpful just for framing the, the structure. And, and then a lot of fiction, too, just mm -hmm. for um, things like, like Blindness I found uh, really inspiring, and um, that book, um, Bel Canto, just this idea of uh, a small group of people trapped in a circumstance of extreme and, and the small world that they create and the different rules of that world. Mm, that's very interesting. So uh, now, Jill, your, your book is in just remarkable in so many uh, ways, just as a piece of writing. And I thought, um, as a reader of history, also a little bit sui generis, I don't know whether there are models that you were looking at, but you seem to unpack your subject matter, even while you had this great devotion to it. And there are these stanzas on pages that almost feel like you're breaking out a little poetry, even when you're using found That's sentences. Found <laughs> yes. uh, and, and then this, the, the chapters are quite spare, and, and you keep moving. Uh, it almost feels like you have a design in, in mind with the way you order the chapters and end them. But what, what's going on there? Have you written this way before, really breaking things out and allowing kind of almost stanzas to drop onto a page that way? No, this was its own kind of weird exper experiment. And it was a, I, I found it a really difficult book to write. And I threw away, I wrote 250 pages and threw every single page away. It was like the first thing that I did. There seemed to be some real liabilities to my choice of subject. One is, there was no ticking clock. Like, there's, there really is no energy. I've been listening for 83 years. <laughs> and it's a kind of cradle to grave. And the first, the mistake I made the first time around was, oh, and the, the other problem is, uh, Jane Franklin is a dark room, and Benjamin Franklin is the candle. Like, you can never see her unless he's in the room. Mm -hmm. And he's so funny and charming and brilliant and interesting <laughs> and wonderful that it's really hard to really care about her when he's there. Yeah, what, is, what does he have to say about this? <laughs> and, and, and she will only say these sort of, especially the first few decades, where she says nothing. And then when she starts, her voice survives, and she says all these daffy 18th century things like, oh, I'm just a woman. I have no opinion on the matter. You know? <laughs> so you have just decades of quiet, and then you have decades of demural, and it's really, it's really frustrating. <laughs> so the, the, um, the, the problem at first was I started with, their births and ended with their death. And so if you think of kind of like a 
an x-axis where time is moving forward, they start in the same place. They're both the children of a poor Boston candle maker. And then, you know, she, her life is sort of pretty much this. Like, she marries the next door neighbor when she's 15. She gets pregnant. She has 12 children. They all die. She dies. <laughs> she's as poor as she was when she started. And he's Benjamin Franklin. His life is <laughs> <laughs> and so I got to about here. And they were like this. And I was just like, this is so horrible. Like, narratively, <laughs> the problem is, we, in my house, the kids would always call the book The Prince and the Pauper. But, but, you, but actually, it's like, it's, they never switch places. <laughs> so you get to about the middle, the middle of, like you look to fiction for your model, and you, you're wanting the prince and the, you want suddenly to, there to be this dramatic reversal, like Franklin is brought low. And, <laughs> and suddenly James living like a queen. Like, you, like as a reader, you, well, you desperately crave that change. And, and there, it, it never, it never, never comes. And I just thought, narratively, the book's just a drag. Like, it's just a drag. Um, so I, I came up with a bunch of different strategies to address that. One was, and this is, is I would say this is slightly fishy as a historical maneuver, but I wrote a long preface in which I said, here's why I did it. I promise it was legitimate. A lot of things that have, because Jane's life involved raising children, when she was raising, she had like a house of four children under the age of four when she was 79. I mean, picture this work. But uh, though letters from that point, stage of her life do survive, and which she says, dear brother, I have not a minute to write. My little ones are interrupting me every second. <laughs> and, and end of letter, you know. Um, but it's something she wrote, you know, in the 1780s. In describing her life when she had her own first four young children, I used that letter, you know. And as I'll say, like, a, I'll quote her saying, just so that reader can have the pleasure of her company and her voice on the page. Because otherwise, you have to wait until she's 79 years old to hear her complain about how tired she is taking care of the children. So, you know, in a footnote, I say she wrote this letter in 1786. Um, but women's lives involve a lot of cyclical experiences. But for me, I'm a pretty uh, empirical historian, and that, that it was really hard to come to the decision that that was okay. But when I decided to do that, it really helped because then she's animated on the page, and then she holds her own with Franklin because he's off, you know founding the library company of Virginia, of Philadelphia. But she's doing something pretty interesting, too. Um, and the other thing I did was I expanded the timeline. So the book doesn't begin with her birth. It begins uh, when the son of Edward VIII starts keeping a, a diary, a chronicle of his life, a chronicle of the king. And then uh, when the, the next monarch requires all the parishes and all of the kingdom to keep a register of all the births and deaths in the kingdom. It's sort of like the beginning, the beginnings of a tradition of recorded history in, in, in England. And it ends, um, and the story, this story really ends with Jane's Book of Ages ending up in, in a library in Boston. So that I tried to make it less a biography of this one person and more a meditation on how history comes to be written from what's saved and what we forget is everything that it else is lost. So it's really devicey in that sense, um, and, and not every book requires, I mean, that sort of narrative intervention. That, that, there's a lot of artifice in, in every good book and a lot of craft. This one felt to me that there was more artifice called for because of the evidentiary problems. We'll call it art, not artifice. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, Adrian, in your manuscript, uh, this is a little bit of a departure from the subject of composition because you're still still finding your way forward. But it has something to do with the conception of the book, which you did so well describing before. But in your manuscript, you said that uh, you were searching for this subject from New England, where your mother had removed you, uh, saying she would never raise a daughter in the Delta, even though that's where you were a child. So, so She's what's right there. yeah? So, <laughs> so uh, tell, <laughs> well done. Uh, <laughs> obviously, it worked out well. <laughs> so, so what? Um, what about your relationship with the Delta had framed your kind of curiosity? And what Delta do you, did you have in mind from a distance that you were seeking to sort of sink into through this project? Well, I initially came at the story as wanting to write about my own family history in the Delta. When did you leave? Uh, or do we you even were... remember it? <laughs> <laughs> My great grandmother, Mama D, is sort of the matriarch of a generation of women, my mother included, who was sort of the first, aside from my own mother, the first real role model I had growing up. So we would go and 
we stayed with Mama D, and she moved to uh, Cleveland, Mississippi, which is Bolivar County, which is the town I'm writing about, or the region I'm writing about. She moved there um, so that her children would go to college. So she bought a little tiny house right next to the college, and she wasn't sure if any of them would ever go to school. She was, her parents were sharecroppers, and sure enough, lo and behold, every one of her children went to school, every one of her grandchildren went to school. So it's, it's sort of a, it's a homecoming for me to report this, not that, you know, I'm Chinese American, but that I'm Southern in a way. So it's going back At to the roots. <laughs> 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 At literate. So it's going back to the roots of kind of where I'm from. But there's a, there's a level of distance I think you have to have as a reporter. But at the same time, it's almost a compassionate distance. You have to look at it as, you have to love your subject so much that you're willing to devote, in my case now, you know, the next year, two years of my life to this. But I can't love it enough that it distorts my vision of it. So I think the Delta is a little bit like that for me in a place in that um, I describe it to people as a second language, you know, that my mother, when she talks about her childhood, she speaks in a southern accent. And it's, it's a little bit like um, you're learning to speak this language and go to this place but at the same time, you're not losing that critical distance that you need to be able to tell a story effectively. So I think that's actually an asset to me that I was raised here and not down there. Not that I don't love it down there, but I think that distance is really crucial in the reporting process. Right. The artist in residence had that, that same college in the fall. That's mm -hmm. our college oh, wow. that's right. that's 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 lovely. <laughs>